Hello, I'm Moni Vargas, the Creative and Program Director at Breakthrough, a nonprofit culture change organization that uses media, arts, and tech to promote human rights. Welcome to Breakthrough Spotlight, our weekly video and podcast series featuring conversations with community leaders, activists, artists, and partner organizations working to build a world that is more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable for all. Thanks for joining us. I would like to welcome all of you to another episode of Breakthrough Spotlight. Uh, before we begin, uh, I just want to take a moment to close our eyes and take a few long, deep breaths together. Uh, I think it's an important moment to remember the lives that we've lost. Uh, and let's just uh, center ourselves, and take some deep, deep breaths, and I will call some names in remembrance. We'll begin with Brianna Taylor. Atatiana Jefferson, Olua Toyen Salau, Rhea Milton, Dominique Fells, Joanna Medina, Elijah McLean, Carlos Ernesto Escobar Mejia, Nina Pop, Nakia Crawford, Tony McDade, George Floyd, Richard Brooks, Ahmad Arbery, Sean Monterosa, and the countless black and brown lives harmed and killed by police, racial violence, and the global pandemic of COVID-19. All right, thank you for being here. Uh, we are really blessed today to uh, have Darnell Moore joining us. Uh, Darnell is the award-winning author of the phenomenal No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. He's also a writer in residence at the Center of African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice at Columbia University, and a 2019 Senior Fellow at the Edinburgh Innovation Lab, the University of Southern California. He's the Director of Inclusion and Strategy of Content and Marketing at Netflix, and Darnell is currently working on his second book, tentatively titled Unbecoming, Visions Beyond the Limits of Manhood. He's also a Breakthrough Board member and the person responsible for bringing me on to Breakthrough. So I am forever grateful um, for that, Darnell. And uh, I'm just really uh, pleased and, and really honored to have you with us today. Um, thank you for making time. You know, I'm very, very happy to be in conversation with you and um, just really grateful for breakthroughs, uh, the, the, all the work that you're doing in the world. And yeah, I'm happy to be talking to you on it. Thank you. Our talk today alludes to Robin Kelly's Freedom Dreams. And for those of you who've never heard of it, it's a uh, history of renegade black intellectuals and artists that encourage us to envision a world without oppression. And it's, it's basically a historical look at what that has um, looked, looked at, you know, throughout the African diaspora over the last century. So this was um, a source of inspiration um, for the project that you developed at Breakthrough uh, and then brought me into direct. And um, it you know, documents the lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, um, POC, young women and gender nonconforming youth, um, and really uplifts their work as organizers and activists, artists and movement builders. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we spoke about this, but I really want to share this with the world because um, I really feel that uh, I, I want to get a sense of um, why this work um, inspired you and um, in you specifically and you know why is it more important now than ever to uplift and amplify the stories and work of women of color and gender nonconforming youth yeah it's a wonderful question and I'm so glad that you shouted out Robin D Kelly Robin DG Kelly um, so I love that book one, because it really does lift up the ways that when we think about um, radical political formations or radical 
black politics or black liberation politics, often we forget how central to those politics and to those social formations, to the organizing work that took place, um, art and culture was to that work. And art and culture in many ways can be, is often a vehicle for change, but it's not often considered um, a powerful tool in the way that like the disruptive practices of like protest are. Um, but Robin D. Kelly reminds us about the power of art and culture as tools, not only for world remaking, um, but for also sort of a type of ideological liberation for the uplift of, of Black folk. Um, so that said, like as a cultural worker, as a, as a writer, as an artist, whose works are not separate from um, the work of liberation. You know, every word that I write in a way of, and I think the, there's a, gene, look, there's a genealogy of Black and Latinx and Indigenous writers whose words birthed new ways of being in the world. It was through the words of folk like Audre Lorde and June Jordan and Cheryl Clark um, and a Kambahi River Collective, right? And like Pat Parker, it was through their poet poetics, it was through their written word that I came to into being um, as a, as I was sort of born again in consciousness as a person who understood the impact of sexism, patriarchy, misogyny on my life, the ways that I was complicit in all of those, in all of those systems of oppression, the ways that I benefited from them. Um, and if their words had not been there, if their voices had not been there, if their art had not been there, if their cultural work had not touched me, I may not have come through a trajectory of growth in the way that I did. So this is the power of art, art and culture. Um, and then I look at, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a black, cis man who was grown by black women who, who were black girls actually when they raised me um and it was in the home where i learned the politics and uh, of sort of radical care um it's in the home where i understood that the labor that they were committing were both forms of visible and invisible labor that the state just did not deem important um but had everything to do with my livability so and all that to say, like when I think about a project that you like the, the one you are now directing, it is so critical that we get the voices of young perps, young people, whether the girls, femmes, um, who are folk who are black and brown and indigenous, who are from working poor, undocumented, um, middle class spaces, so that they can have a space through which they can speak on their own terms where they can create or at least insert into an archive that when I think about archives and, and spaces of public discourse where our voices are not present, archives can be spaces where our narratives die. But when we give, put the tools in the hands of young people to speak on their own terms, their voices, their, their livelihoods, their narratives will never be able, we, we won't be able to sort of like invisibilize or mute them. So that's why it's powerful to me. I'm excited about the project that Breakthrough is leading. Yes, uh, I'm. You know, every time that we conduct interviews and um, really spend time with this incredible group of young folks, uh, one, I'm obviously always learning something because they're really pushing the boundaries of everything we know to be quote unquote normal or. Uh, <clears throat> a given, you know, it's 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 really um, transformative in uh, in in how they approach um, their lives uh, and and the ideas that they're sharing um, and um, like you said, it's so easy to in, in visibilize um, not only uh, you know young people uh, and but but especially um, young girls and gender non-conforming youth of color. Um, and, I, and I do feel that we're at this point where they are leading, you know, they are leading conversations. They're the ones um, in the front lines. Um, so, you know, all to say that, um, you know, I was, you, you pretty much answered all my, my next questions. One, I was just curious, you know, how you became such a strong feminist ally, um, but you, you pretty much, covered that I think when you're you know when you're raised by women um, and you notice the work that goes into raising a child 
um, especially raising, you know, a, a black child, a, a brown child in this country. Uh, it's it's a lot. Of, it takes a, it takes a toll. I mean, um, the, the thing that I, I I should name here is that one of the things I learned from black feminists, I owe so much to black feminists, um, to black women in my life, to black lesbian, mm -hmm. black queer, um, black trans women in my life. Um, they taught me the importance of self-reflexive analyses or, I mean, a less fancy term is self-reckoning. Um, what I understood from their work, their politics was about not only um, developing an ability to analyze all the modes of oppression, all of the violences in the world that, um, that are operative but more like how do you locate the I in the intersection? How do you um, also ex evaluate the extent to which any one of us might be complicit in the oppression of the other? Um, and their politics was one, a death politics, death. It, it allowed, it, it's a politic that requires one to go deep, not just deep, you know, in terms of sort of like having access to language and rhetoric and theory, but deep in, in, in other words, what I mean, it requires of anyone who names themselves as part of a black feminist in genealogy to go to the depth of oneself. They were in, in circles saying, here we are, you know, as quote unquote codified as women um, for those that were allowed that category. <laughs> um, and we realized that even among this group, racism, it, you know, the, the whiteness that is present in some of these spaces um, is an oppressive apparatus that doesn't allow for us to even be sitting in the same room with equitable livelihoods. And then you had lesbian women saying, and you know, you've got these black feminists saying, but wait, if we're going to have a black feminist politic or a womanist politic, we got to be clear that some of the women are lesbian. And some of those women are bi, and some of those women are working poor. Maybe they're not all in college settings. Some of them are sex workers and they're out on the streets. Some of them are houseless. Some of them are trans. And that ability to dissect and work through a politics of death, a politics that allows one to not be settled in a category, you know, there are ways that we, any of us can see ourselves as, um, as a sort of like a, 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 a survivor of, of, of oppressive forces, but just as easily as we can survive oppressive, oppressive forces, we ourselves can inflict oppression on others. And that is what feminism taught me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also um, what I'm loving right now is how um, these same black feminist thinkers are pushing the idea that's been there for uh, decades, but are really at the forefront of, and I don't want to say pushing in the sense that they are, um, uh, that they that they're leading um, the conversations, let's just say that, uh, when it comes to um, abolition uh, politics and uh, and uh, we just recorded something earlier where we uh, spoke about um, Angela Davis uh, recently said you know it is um, we, we have to recognize the trans movement and the non-binary and in really helping uh, the zeitgeist you know mass mass culture understand that if we can break down um, what we think of the binary, which is, you know, what we all think of as being so rooted in what we do every single day, then if we can abolish that, if we can break that down, then why not break down prisons? Why not break down these um, very oppressive systems that um, we have been conditioned to believe to be uh, normal, <laughs> which, you know, when you look at it, it's not, none of this is normal. You know, what is normal? Um, so, you know, tell us a bit about, um, about, you know, maybe perhaps um, today, where, you know, where are you, where are you finding inf inspiration? Um, I know it's everywhere right now, and, and I love that. But, um, you know, are there any youth, um, youth ad activists, thinkers, writers right now that you're really, um, inspired by 
I'll just share one thing. So Derricka Purnell, I I just, I, I, you know, it's one of those things that I'm like, where have you been my whole life? I just recently started digging in a couple of, like a month ago and um, just loving her. <laughs> Um, but I just, you know, where what what's inspiring you right now? So, you know, there are people like yeah, Derricka Pinnell and um, Al Hearns and Mar uh, Mariam Kaba. Um, e doing, I mean, I can go down the line of folk who have inspired me in this moment. Um, I'm I'm really, really deeply, deeply inspired by um, this this iteration of a movement that has centered abolitionism as um, and not just this iteration. I mean, abolitionism is a framework that has been in preceded movements, um, preceded the movements that we're in. But I love how it's been a framework that has been adopted in so many ways across this broad swath of this movement iteration. So I just want to shout out folk for whom, who have made my learning um, possible with regards to abolition, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, Angela Davis, of course, um, and it was through Ruth, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore that I understood in a very simple way um, abolitionism as a, as a political project. And, and what, what, she, what she offered was this, like so many ways we think about abolitionism or abolition as the removal of the bad things that don't work, the, the removal of the things that do us harm. Um, prison, jails is one of those things, right? Um, but abolitionism as a politic, as a political vision, as also um, a framework for transformation is also about imagining and building the things that ought to go in place of the stuff that we need to get rid of. And that to me is like, I call that like, and that is a politics of faith um, it's such like, because what, and, and you know, I'm coming from, as a person who sort of like tabbles in theology, I'm often thinking about in Christian theology for all that that's worth, but I often think about what it means to um, have a politics that is not only about the, the deconstruction or the removal of a thing, but about the, the possibility, the aspirational vision, a practice of faith, a practice of creating a thing in place of the things that do us harm. And that is such a powerful, powerful, powerful um, politic. Because when we say defund the police, people here get rid of a thing that we've relied on so long. The only thing that we know to keep us safe. But as an abolitionist, when you say defund the police, what you're saying is get rid of or defund the police as a first step or as an, a, a sort of a, a lateral step, as, a, as an equal step in terms of us imagining and building the, the processes, the things that can go into place of the system that does us harm. Isn't that amazing? It's a politics of hope. That is a politics of faith. That is a politics of like, that is itself a, like a political manifestation of a freedom dream. So I am so inspired by um, folks ardent, ardent, positioning and saying, no, we're not going to move from, from this standpoint. This is, you know, and this is young folk who are benefiting from the long sustained work of organizer, activists, and intellectuals like Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, like Marion Kaba, like Angela Davis, like all of the other Black feminists and, and, and Black intellectuals and Black organizers, names who we don't even know, Latinx organizers, undocumented folk. Um, queer and trans and non-binary folk who have been articulating these politics that have found re that have resonated are now finding their way like as, as central to a movement and it's pretty remarkable. I'm inspired. I am too. I mean, I feel like this is finally. I like I feel a sense of hope, and and I think um, to take it back to um, to Robin Kelly, you know, I, I pulled a quote and it says, you know, he says, uh, people are drawn to social movements because of hope, um, because they are dreaming of a new world that's radically different from the one they inherited. And I think that's where we're at right now. You know, we're realizing that the system is broken. We're realizing that the system works for a very small percentage of our people. Of, of the population even. Um, and that includes poor white folks. You know, that includes, that's, that includes 
people living in poverty. It includes undocumented folks. It includes um, all of us who don't have uh, universal health care or are houseless. Um, you know, it's beyond. Um, we're not fighting just for, 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 for us, for ourselves. It's like you're fighting for the 90% <laughs> or 80, 85 percent of us out there who are really not benefiting at all from, from the systems. So um, you know, that said, there's this one question uh, also from the book that I loved, and it says, you know, how do we produce a vision that enables us to see beyond our immediate ordeals? And, and how do we transcend this bitterness and cynicism, right? So that grace, love, and hope. Um, and you, you alluded to the fact that it is sometimes, you know, anchored in also Christian ideology, you know, at least the, the types of, of, of um, teachings of Jesus, because there's, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, you know, sometimes these ideologies are co-opted. But... Um, but you know, during these super uncertain times, um, how do we build that sense of hope up um, for everyone? You know, for those of us who um, don't are not able to work remotely, who have lost their jobs, who have lost hope. You know, what what do we do? You know, and, and yeah. it's a big question. So I'm not <laughs> I'm not putting it all on you, Darnell. But you know, I'm, no, 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 I, I um. I, um, a, a couple thoughts. One, you know, I'm very thoughtful about notions of hope, notions of grace um, that denies folk who are violently impacted by structural inequity, racialized violence, anti blackness, um, that denies us our full humanity and what. And, and by denying us our full humanity, it means that as a, as a human person, and let's be clear that for, for Black people, humanity had been a category that had been denied us, but as a human person, rage and um, being fed up and being at one's wit's end is a rational and actually logical emotion to maintain. So I'm never too quick to tell people to move towards hope or grace particularly as a way because of Christ the way that Christian ideology has pretty much told the person, the sufferer, the person who's the other, the, those who are like uh, dejected to somehow um, see their, their turmoil <laughs> as, um, as a blessing. It's a twisted theology. So I don't want to go down that. That's, I want to just say no, that. Absolutely not. Um, what I will say is that um, there is something to be said um, about putting my hope in this moment, and I wrote this in the book, like is not in the, uh, in, in, the in the sort of state project, right? Like the, the, the sort of American project to, to ever, um, and I'm going to use the word save, but to like to be, to, 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 to save Black people. My hope is in Black people. My hope are, is in the, the, the solidarity movements that are out in the streets um, and the visions that are being birthed, the political visions for a new way of being um, that are being birthed in communities um, of the impacted. Um, and that to me is where hope is generated and sort of how it can be used. And, um, and that's where I well, it's I, I am inspired by our fierce opposition to the old inequities that have always been. That is where my hope comes from. That the more of us, that the more of us continue to find um, a spot <laughs> in the work to like undo all of these forms, like all of the, the, the sort of rudimentary ways of life in this space, in this country, and not just in this, I mean, around the globe that like we have become so, um, so that have become so normalized for us. Um, so that's what I, I come to think about hope in this particular moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and I think um, what you said, and, and I just recently read this, um, you, you were moderating an intergenerational panel with President Obama 
um, and, and, and some beautiful um, black souls that um, I just had so much to share. And, uh, and you, you termed, you know, this, describe this moment as a storm within a storm, right? And, um, and there's no denying it. You know, it's, I feel like everything um, has been magnified. Everything is compounded on top of COVID, on top of this pandemic. And, uh, and yeah, I do feel that it's, it's, it's a moment where um, you can't deny what's not working. You know, you can't run away from it. Um, you know, that said, um, do we, um, and, 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 and it's an interesting, and it's an interesting moment, um, but um, for the immediate, for the immediate moment, um, what, you know, what is bringing you joy? Like what is, um, how are we able to sustain um, everything that we're seeing, right? Because it's a yes. lot. It's a lot. I, I, I'm having a hard time, to be honest. And You know, like the things that are bringing me joy. Um, um, so a couple of things that I'm doing. One, I have um, set with myself to understand my my limits. You know, I can't I'm, I, I can't watch for instance, incessant tapes of videos of black people being being slain, killed, murdered. Um, I had spent a lot of time working in media, reporting on creating media assets, stories around, um, and I mean the list of names go on and on and having to incessantly take that in had become um, poisonous for me. I think it's helpful for maybe some, I don't know, but for me, for me, I don't need to be convinced that anti-blackness is real, um, that these that 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 this type of violence is a thing. I don't need to be convinced of that. I do not need to see another death in order to know that. So what that meant is that I stopped watching it. That's helped me. Um, I've also um, have, as a person who has been like uh, activated in a lot of ways and in, in, in like public spaces and doing like a lot of sort of public oriented and public facing work, it's important for me to rem like a as a practice to give just as much energy to my people, to my family, my sisters, my mama, my nieces, my nephews, my neighbors, as I would any person that I might be organizing alongside of or working alongside of. And then sometimes there's a way in which in my life, like my politics felt so, politics have to be lived out um, in every facet of one's life. I, I'll give one example. I was going to a, a march some years ago in Union, in Union Square in New York City, and I remember going to the march, all amped, ready to be out there, turning, <laughs> turning up. And um, in the middle of my travels, I remember stopping to think, how am I going to go out here with my fists lifted up in the air, chanting about the mattering of Black lives when I just left bed to go to Union Square and on the way past so many Black people that I never stopped and smiled at, never stopped and asked how they're doing. So a politic that's radical to me is living it out, not in the sort of spectacular ways in which we're thought to do so, but the politic is when you're stopping and saying, Black person, I see you. I see you on the A train. How you doing? Do you have a need? Do you have a do you do you need an MCA card, right? So I've been thinking about the everyday ways that we, that a politic ought to be practiced, um, whether that's like on the streets, in the kitchen. Um, so I've opened up my space um, here in California to do barbecues with my friends. I'm around people that I don't need to teach how not to harm me. I am purposefully making space for those that America likes to deny its love from, you know, like, so that is where my joy comes in. I'm dancing to the songs of folk who are singing liberation into my spirit to people like that. And I'm, I'm dancing, I'm singing, I'm like spending with the arts, with black art, and like that is where joys come from. Come from for me. I'm very, very committed to. Me. I'm going on vacation as of tomorrow, um, until like the middle of July, because there's like we can't be good to anybody if we're not good to ourselves. So I want to make sure and our and our people. So for me, it's all about. Yeah, I often say like my joy comes from giving love to the to the to the people for whom love has been denied 
and that to me is 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 the thing that like just brings me so much happiness. Yes. Yes. I you know, it's interesting because um I've been doing a lot of just spending time with music uh, and really um, listening to my daughter. Um, I think that, you know, um, I don't think she's listening. And the other day she just completely said you know, like what breakthrough does in, in one, in one full sentence. I'm like, I didn't even know you heard me say this, but um, what's interesting right now is that um opening up to what your family needs, what the ones around you need, um, what you need is, is imperative to um, continue the work because uh, like you said, I, I can't watch. I, I've stopped watching the news. I get my news um, sometimes uh, from you know publications online, but I can't watch video anymore because it was it's traumatizing, and I and like you said, I you you have to create boundaries for yourself um, so that you can continue um, with sanity. I mean, I, I think that that um, as as much as we like to think that uh, uh, that it may not be affecting us, I know that I can't watch it. I can't even hear it. I can't hear um, the descriptions. Right. So I've, I've completely stopped that as well. Um, you know, that said, uh, I, I'm also curious um, as a creative, you know, are there any practices that you're doing? Um, I know that last year you took time to finish your book during one of your vacation moments. Um, uh, and I'm wondering uh not that there's any pressure because sometimes it's just not time to write. It's time to be. Um, but I'm just curious if you're doing anything, um, you know, within your creative, uh, your, I feel like you're always being creative, but are there any creative practices that you have found to be helpful right now? For sure. It's been really hard over the last several weeks, maybe several months really um, to write. I'm a writer and it's, it's been hard to find words to be quite honest. So um I've struggled with that, but writing, you know, writing is, can be <sighs> cathartic, um, but writing can also be, um, you know, we're in a period where isolation and loneliness is such like par for the, par for the, like the moment. Um, it's been just hard. Yeah, it's been hard to write, hard, hard to find words, but writing nonetheless, right? Um, and also trying to hammer out a screenplay so I'm teaching myself <laughs> as I'm writing it. Um, and that's been scary, um, but also an invitation to like grow my creative capacity. Um, I've also been part of these every other week um, Zoom calls, a small group of black creatives, um, like seven of us um, crossing the sort of lines of film, um, music, uh, literature, poet, poetry. We just get together for an hour on Sunday and just vibe and share our works in progress and um, check on each other to, to 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 support each other, and that has been been super helpful. Um, you know, and I work in a creative field, but part of that is like when you're working. Um, part of the challenge is coming home and finding energy to do your own work. So balance, balance is key, um, but I often have to remind myself that it's important to set boundaries so that my creative projects can breathe and, and, not are, and, and aren't asphyxiated, choked, um, because of my inability to give, to give it time, so. Well, um, that, that's exciting. I'm, I'm so happy that you're diving into screenwriting and, I think, you know, um, as with everything, you know, it's, it's so important to get our stories out there, um, whatever those stories may be. Um, obviously, um, there does seem to be a black renaissance, 
um, and there's still not enough, you know, there's still, I'm still going, going through, like, I've already seen all these, you know, what's next? Um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to, to read and then eventually see what, 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 you, what you're working on, Darnell. Um, so, you know, we, I'm, I'm just being mindful of, of your time. Um, uh, you know, is there anything else that you want to speak about, uh, you know, at this moment? I just say that, like, I think the last thing I'll say, um, is that I'm really grateful for breakthrough and the specific ways you can intervene in this moment. Um, Breakthrough is in many ways a creative hub. It's a hub of creativity, of folk who um, not only have their pulse and on, on culture, um, on social movement, um, but people who bl bring a political, a, a, a politics to their creative work. Um, so you all are filmmakers, you're animators, you're um, writers and how amazing we started off by talking about freedom dreams but what, when you really think about it the work that you're doing makes freedom dreams possible because you are our cultural workers and artists so i'm just thankful that there is an intervention um like breakthrough the work that you're doing the work that um that you that the team is doing in a moment like this because we need the cultural workers we need the artists um you are able to sort of articulate our ideas through art practices and bring to vision, um, and, and not just vision, but bring to the fore the lives of young people, particularly right now um, through film. So I'm just wanna give kudos to y'all and um, a big shout to how you're intervening right now. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's a real honor. You know, I feel an honor just to be able to document these stories and, and to be present for these stories and and to know that other people will be able to see these stories in the future and now, but also in the future. I mean, it is um, a real, uh, I feel like this is a turning point um, for us as a society. And I think um, it is not only important um, to amplify their voices, um, but I think we'll all benefit from it. You know, it's 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 something that will uplift all of us. Um, so thank you for those um, very kind words, um, and um, and thank you for being here. Thank you for making time. I know that uh, your time is so precious right now, and uh, and you know we we will always be here. So if you ever wanna. Um, get anything off your chest, you know, you know where to go. Um, because we, we love, um, we just love you. We love what you're doing and, um, and we appreciate you. Um, you. so yeah, so thanks Darnell. Um, Thank you. That love is mutual. And that wraps up another episode of Breakthrough Spotlight. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, please remember that this programming is made possible with donations from viewers like you. So every donation, uh, whether it's large or small or tiny or one-time donation, really helps us continue our work to create a world that is more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable for all. This is Moni Vargas signing off. Uh, stay well, healthy, spread love, and peace. Thank you. Thank you.